Hi everybody. So, today's lecture is on alarm systems and smoke alarms. And let's start by going way back into times of old, or in the days of yore, maybe, depending how you like to think of medieval times. Anyway, back in the olden times, if you had some sort of structure or big house that you wanted to protect, like a castle, you would have usually human beings as your source of alarming and perimeter monitoring. You might also have some kind of moat as a perimeter defense around your castle. It's harder to swim than walk on land when you're invading a castle. But you would also have human beings posted, you know, little guys and gals posted on these watchtowers to shout or see if anyone was going to invade the castle or attack it. So you have these perimeter monitoring positions. Now, maybe if you have a moat, you're going to have more people watching this entrance here, your main gate. And same thing for... You know, your olden times, ye old smoke alarms. A ye old smoke alarm, if you had smoke rising out of this castle. Because of a fire that was not wanted. You would have to have a person shouting, fire, fire. You know, and then you get a bucket brigade and you put it out, all that good stuff. So, this would be you know, with the human beings and the moat and all this kind of alarm system, this would be an unsupervised circuit. Because let's say this little guy up here is supposed to be watching for a boat in case they try to invade with a boat. And let's say this guy falls off the tower and he lands in the water. Well, until that boat invades this part of the castle and breaches the castle walls, you don't know that this part of the system is not working until either another person comes and checks or until something happens and the alarm doesn't go off. So just like our unsupervised circuits, where unless we look at a wire or look at a device to see if it's been tampered with. We don't know if this security system is working unless there's human beings walking around all the time checking. So this is sort of a an unsupervised circuit, if you will. It doesn't have current running through it. You could al also think of it as unsupervised because you need a person to go and activate the alarm. Now we don't have, they don't have buzzers and flashing lights in the olden times. You would need someone to go ring a bell or something of that nature, or just start shouting. So that's kind of olden times alarms, but in our modern houses, and this is actually a picture from the uh, Laban prints that are for your um, last code module. But in our modern houses, we don't usually have moats or guards posted in towers. So we use primarily electrical devices that monitor uh, the places that are easiest to break into, which is for the most part doors and windows. Where's other windows? Okay, there's not that many windows in this house for some reason. There should be a window here. That'd be nice. But now someone could take a big saw and a huge hole saw and a big saws all and just, you know, just cut out this wall of your house, but that's going to be pretty noisy. That's not a very good way to break into this house. Most likely they're going to break in through the doors or the windows. And we use sort of perimeter devices for our perimeter defense. You can think of it as your first line of defense. Most people don't have devices for their alarm system out on the front lawn or the back lawn. You might have a light that turns on from a motion detector. But we would not exactly consider that a security device, even though it's 
could be called a security light or it could be used as a, a deterrent. But the security light, that, that motion detector light, is probably not going to um, alarm the system or put the system into alarm. So the primary, the, the primary or the first device we use the most part for our windows and doors, that is, are these magnetic reed switches. Now, this is just a magnet, and then this part of the device has a magnet that, when close to this magnet, would pull this armature down, making the contact, because we'll terminate our wires on this screw. This is one conductor coming in, and then another wire could terminate on this screw. And so when this magnet gets moved away from this magnet, this armature, because of this spring, the spring would push the armature up and it would break the contact. So that's just a basic magnetic reed switch. And I did a super high tech digital drawing for this. Anyway, normally how they're installed is if this is your door, forgot to add a a doorknob. So you put just the magnet on the door and then you put this magnetic reed switch on the door frame. So when the door is closed these magnets are close enough to pull this contact shut. Now if you've ever heard um, or entered someone's house that has an alarm system that vocalizes or the the little control device or the cpu will vocalize you know front door open or back door open or back door closed or front door closed something like that that is because at that cpu the central processing unit these two wires go back to a specific place that tell that central unit that hey this read switch this is for the front door, or the back door, or whatever, or maybe a window. And so as you open and close, this is all one cable, let's say, as you open and close that door, this contact will open and close. Pretty, uh, pretty simple little device. We're using magnets. We're not using electromagnets here, but pretty simple and effective device. Now here's an example of a just a surface mounted magnetic reed switch. So you would put screws through these two holes mounted to either the door or the frame. And some of them have wires coming out. Other ones have these screws and these are just your two contact points. So if you put this on a window frame or sorry, if you use this for a window to know if the window was opened or closed, you would put this on the window frame and this on the window. Now windows have the extra problem of um, the glass being broken, which is a different detection de device. So primarily we use these for doors and other things that open and close. Now the surface mounted ones are not as secure as these uh, recessed magnetic reed switch. These are going to function the same way. The difference being um, usually a hole is drilled in the frame and then the hole is drilled in the door. And these recessed magnetic reed switches actually just go right into the hole. So when the door is closed, these two switches or the, sorry, these two magnets will be close enough to close the contacts. And as the door opens, these magnets would move away and the same function would happen for our surface mount magnetic reed switch. So these are more secure. You'll usually see these in more uh, commercial applications, but either way, they, can, they, uh, they function the same. They just get installed a little different. Now, overhead doors are also usually, you know, we can use magnetic reed switches to see if they're open or closed. Um, the problem being, of course, they're generally more affected by the weather. They don't 
sort of close and latch as tightly. They're just on a, a on a track, so the whole door may move and kind of bend with uh, wind or just general weather changes. So because of that, we use different magnetic reed switches for overhead doors. They're usually uh, stronger magnets. It's usually a larger device. Um, here is one. It's just a picture of one that was installed. So once again, this is just a larger magnetic reed switch. There's still a cable going to it, right? And this is an armored cable or it's maybe armored flex. Sometimes they come pre-installed. You can, you know, in this app, this might be a residential garage door. So you could actually drive over this one and you just anchor. This would be where the magnet with the contacts are on the floor and you would anchor this to the floor. And then this magnet would be attached to the door and it would travel with the door. So just a larger magnet. It's intended to, you know, if this magnet gets gets pushed this way because there's a large gust of wind pushing on the door or it gets pushed this way because there's difference of pressure, the magnet is still going to be mostly centered over the magnetic reed switch, still closing those contacts to avoid nuisance tripping. Now, what's the most common failure in an alarm system? Usually it's poor installation. Because those magnets need to be orientated correctly. You can imagine if, let's say this is a North Pole and this is a South Pole, for example, and this is maybe the North and this is the South, they're not gonna function the way we want them to. They're not gonna be, there's not gonna be enough magnetic lines of flux working, you know, in the, in the attraction side or in the, in the attraction way to keep the contacts closed. So this is just uh, this is obviously from your module, but this is just sort of a good example of, you know, the major problem or the major problems that come up in alarm systems is usually um, poor installation. Now, one more example of a magnetic reed switch. This could be, uh, your module has this as a wooden door, but, you know, you can drill out. Usually metal doors are not solid. Uh, some wood doors aren't either these days, which is unfortunate. But if you have a solid wood door, you could take one of those recessed magnetic reed switches, drill a hole that would fit this, shove the magnet in there, and then have the switch part or the, the magnet with the switch part of the magnetic reed switch down in the, uh, the runner down here or the threshold, you could call it as well. Of course, the trick would be you'd have to run the wires maybe um, through the, the door frame up and over, or maybe you run it down below. Either way, it requires a little bit of extra work here, even though your module says this is a, a pretty easy installation because you don't have to take the door off, which is probably true. Now the rollerball switch, similar to the magnetic reed switch, um, it's going to be a mechanical switch instead of a magnetic switch. But basically how these work is there is a set of contacts in here. And maybe this goes out to two terminals. And so when there is something sitting on this roller ball, that would close these contacts. Now the roller ball switch and a magnetic reed switch would work well in a supervised circuit. Now we were looking at supervised circuits as having normally closed contacts, which is still somewhat true. Now, when you take this roller ball switch out of the box, those contacts are going to be open, even though when you have this hooked up to the alarm system and you have, you know, this, the statue of this, whoever this important figure was, you have this, this bust of this nobleman sitting on top of that rollerball switch, under normal operation, this switch would be closed. So if we had current going up this way and we had current coming back on this wire while the statue was sitting there, which told our system, yep, everything's good. 
then as soon as you take something off this rollerball switch, those contacts open, and the lack of current coming back would tell the system, so these two wires would probably go back to a some kind of central area, some kind of CPU that's going to process all the information of all the devices. So as soon as current doesn't come back, it says, hey, I got a problem. The statue of Sir whoever is missing. The rollerball switch is now open. That's a problem. So if we drew this, it might be a normally open contact. Not that we're going to draw schematics for alarm systems today. But I just wanted to explain that to say this would be a type of supervised circuit using what is technically a normally open contact. When you take this switch out of the box, it's normally open, but under normal operation, it would be closed. Now back to our garage door. This is going to be what's, what's known as a normally closed loop for alarms. Now, you get home at the end of the day, and you park your car in the garage, and you close the garage door, and you arm the system, or perhaps you leave, you know, drive out of your garage, close the garage door, which means this contact should be closed. When you arm the system, it is going to just send current out here, it'll come back, when the door is closed, that is, it'll come back. It'll say, yep, everything's good. So that way, when the alarm system is armed and just sort of watching all of the devices that it needs to watch, if someone tried to, you know, jimmy this door open and they got a just a huge crowbar and tried lifting the, do the door so they could break into your garage, this perimeter device, once the door is lifted, this magnet would be lifted above the, the reed switch which would open the contacts to say, hey, I'm open, put me into alarm. So it's a normally closed loop, because normally current can come in and back out, in, out, in, out, because the contacts are closed when the door is closed. So if you've ever tried to arm an alarm system when you have a door open or a window open, it might not let you because it'll say, nope, I'm, I'm a normally closed loop, but something's open, so you can't arm me because I'm not, you know, the perimeter is not secure. Now, breaking a window, sort of like opening a door quickly, causes a big change in pressure. Now, if we had a little mercury ball here, and Let's say we had a set of contacts that were in some some sort of dish to catch the mercury, and we had our wires hooked up to those contacts. What they used to use, or how we used to use these type of glass break detectors, is if that big change in pressure comes in from a broken window, this little ball of mercury would fall and it would fill this cup, which would close these contacts because mercury conducts electricity. Similar to how old, you know, old style thermostats used to work. The mercury would um, move basically, or a little, a little function would move a glass tube that had the mercury in it and the mercury would complete the con, um, sorry, would close the contacts by just letting electricity flow through it. So similar function here. If the glass broke near this device, this little ball would fall into this cup and complete the circuit. Now there's also shock sensors. So what's going on here is this little guy is installed with some space between it and the window. That way if there's a, you know, once again, a big weather change or a large gust of wind blowing and just kind of and just moving this window just a little bit, it's not going to set off the sensor. But if someone comes to break this window, that's certainly going to set off the sensor. And so once again, that correct installation matters because there has to be, you know, I'm sure the manufacturer would, or at least they should have some kind of statement or some kind of installation practice to say, 
what that distance is between the shock sensor and the window. But either way, if someone tries to break this window, that's going to move the whole window one way or another, and it's going to set off this sensor. Now we also have acoustic glass break detectors. Um, if you've ever seen one of these, you can actually use a glass break app to set these off. They're basically tuned to the sound of, well, glass breaking. So if your phone can simulate the sound of glass breaking, it'll set this guy off. Or, you know, the actual sound of glass breaking can set it off too. Now, if you break a cup or a dish or, you know, a glass, the glass you drink out of, not the glass for your window, could set it off as well. I think they've, as far as I know, they've gotten better because window, the sound of a window breaking is different than the sound of like a wine glass being dropped on a floor. So they have these programmed for a specific type of glass breaking, but this would be our acoustic glass break. And we would want to put that once again, since installation matters so much for our alarm systems, we want to put that somewhere close to the window. So if you had some big drapes hanging across here, maybe this wouldn't work. You know, maybe you got to put it down here, or maybe, maybe there's a small little table that you would put it, put it on that table or some kind of ledge. But either way, you want that to hear the glass breaking. You want that... This picture is probably better to, to point out that we want the sound waves of broken of the of the window breaking, not just glass, but when the window is broken, we want the sound waves to travel into this device. So where we put this guy is going to matter. And then of course you can have both. Now this would be a uh, acoustic and shock detector, I believe. These are a bit more of the modern um, style because they're still relatively cheap, but with that dual function, it just makes it that much better. Now, normally, not sure if I can see the terminals on this guy. Maybe this would be, oh yeah, we got terminals right down here. So these screws right here <clears throat> would be what we bring our wires to. Now there's code rules for size of wire and you know we can go smaller than a 14 gauge and all that but normally we have about three or four conductors now i'm going to say probably four if we're talking about this guy being dual function so you're going to have you know there's not actually how you'd wire it but you would have two wires for your power so it could be you know let's say it's a 12 volt dc so you'd have our, your positive and your negative of that. And then you would start to have signal wires. So these wires would send a small amount of current back to your CPU to say either, you know, I hear a window being broken, or if it's a shock sensor signal, it would say I feel a window being broken. So that's sort of the dual function. It's gonna require a few more wires it's not going to be as simple as just a wire in and a wire out with a set of contacts closing, but you know, the, the conductors we use for alarm systems are usually quite a bit smaller. You know, if we just have 12 volt DC and milliamps being, being sent on the conductors. So an extra conductor here and there for a better device is usually worth the cost. So what do we do if someone sort of tricks one of these little perimeter devices and sort of breaches our home that we want protected and we want to keep it safe. That's the point of having this alarm system in here. So if we have some Mission Impossible level thieves that are using their talents to get into our homes or our residences or our residential occupations, however you want to word it, we need something to protect the interior of the house. And normally we're gonna use motion detectors. Now, there's a couple different technologies used for motion detectors. Originally, it operated similar to radar. Now, if you don't 
know exactly what that means. Basically, radar would send out pulses like this. So a radar device, you know, from its origin sends out these waves. And if something is blocking that wave, then the radar says, hey, I got a thing here. So if we're using that for a motion detector, ideally nothing would, you know, stop the wave that the motion detector sends out. But when something does, it would go into an alarm state. Now they also use uh, or have used in some places probably still do do, do use, pardon me, uh, microwaves. Now, sort of like when you put your food in your microwave, microwaves, there's that little window of your microwave, um, microwaves, this is your plate of food, actually go through the food. So that can present its own problems if we're using it as a motion detector, because if, if the microwaves go through the wall of a house and are sensing someone, maybe, maybe a car driving by outside and the microwaves are picking up that car because they can travel through the wall. Well, we don't want that to set this system into alarm. We want it in alarm if someone's on the interior. So normally we use what's called a PIR or a passive infrared detector. Most of them look like this, the, uh, the modern versions. And so this is going to function the same. It's going to have that a similar sort of uh, wave pattern or coverage area. And if something that is an abnormal temperature goes past the sensor, it's going to go into an alarm state. Now, you may have heard of the pet alley ones, basically creates, you know, this range where a pet can walk under the motion detector and not set it off. Because if we turn the alarm system on at night and everyone goes to bed, well, you don't want the pet to get up and walk around and set it off. Or if you leave for work or everyone leaves the house for some, for some reason and you set the alarm, you don't want the cat, dog, whatever, setting it off. I mean, maybe if you have a pet bird that flies around the house, they might... They might set it off. But those PIR are the, the pretty, the most common motion detector these days. Um, you'll see them around commercial, residential, all kinds of properties. And it just has this infrared detector in here. And you calibrate the certain range for the, the area it's in. Now, all these devices can be wireless. But... You know, there's some good and bad with the wireless devices. Um, obviously, if you're just sticking a wireless device like a camera or, you know, a magnetic read detector, if you're just sticking it to a surface, that's a pretty fast installation. You know, usually there's like a, a double-sided tape on them or some kind of adhesive to make them stick wherever we want them to stick and monitor and keep safe. They're not as reliable the wireless because now they have a signal now they have to so if this was a wireless device now it has this sort of wireless signal to communicate back to our central control so if that signal gets interrupted that could be a problem either by ductwork or you know maybe the signal just gets messed up all kinds of reasons uh, these would have a battery in them that would operate the device. So you're gonna have to make sure the batteries are changed out regularly. So we got all our fancy devices doing what they do. And this is an example of something they might all come back to. So within here, we usually have our line voltage, usually about, let's say 120 volts. That's most common, that's what I've seen. So you have 120 volts powering all this. We have this big, well, big for the picture, but this decent sized sealed rechargeable lead acid battery. Check that out. It's 12 volts, seven amp hours, and this is our backup power. So 
if we bring in 120 volts to normally power this CPU, is what this is, the central processing unit, that 120 probably gets changed into 12 volts DC. So, and we program it, or it comes programmed, depending, so that if this 120 volt supply is lost, it will, as quick as it can, switch over to this battery power. And so the whole system will stay in operation until this battery runs out of its energy. Now, it's rechargeable because if the power gets lost to this and then it comes back, this 120 volt feed can recharge this battery. So you don't have to just replace it every time the power goes out. Now, either these systems are programmable or they come programmed. Um, this one does not exactly look like a programmable one. There's lots of electronic components, <clears throat> excuse me, electronic components that are sort of predetermined to have a certain function. And then down here would be our different, where our different inputs and outputs would come in. Our inputs would be our signaling devices, our perimeter and interior devices. And then our outputs would be what the alarm wants to communicate to, as in signal devices. It wants to communicate to a signal device to either, you know, make noise or flashlights or do the opposite, not make noise and not flashlights. Now a keypad is a pretty common form of controlling our CPU. You might see some uh, modern systems have a keypad which is attached to has it like a screen as well sometimes it's all a touch screen and then the CPU is actually installed behind all that or other times you have a keypad near the entrances you know near the doors and then you have a main brain that also has a keypad so we want to make sure the CPU is in a secure location now in residential applications that usually means um, not visible from a window so that if someone's trying to break in they can't see what they have to get to in order to turn the system off easily so sometimes we'll put a, a system like this in the interior some kind of secure location but we'll have a keypad by the door usually inside the door, so that as you unlock the door and walk in, the alarm will kind of prime itself and start counting down. But you have this keypad inside the door, so you can put your code in, turns the alarm off, and doesn't, you know, start blaring horns and flashing lights at you. Now, this is a normally open loop. It is also a monitored loop. So what's going on under normal operation, which means there's no intrusion, sorry, intrusion sensor triggered, is that there's current coming out, goes through this resistor, and then it comes back. Now, thanks to Mr. George Ohms, if we had some values, we could see exactly what the current out and in would be. But if one of these sensors closed because someone was intruding or an intruder set off the sensor, then current is going to take the path of least resistance. It's going to go down this switch type of device. Or this device will switch would be another way you could you could put it. So now the current is not going to be just going through resistor, which would give us you know a relatively low current. Now it's going to have a path of less resistance, and so the current's going to be increased. And so this normally open is all of a sudden going to be closed, which is going to signify the CPU, or you know, if the CPU is in this control panel, it's going to signify, hey, there's an intruder. You know, maybe go into alarm, or maybe get ready to go into alarm. If the alarm is not turned off, you know, if the keypad does not have a code put into it after a certain amount of time. So this is a normally open 
right? So current can't go through here under normal, normal operation. Current won't go through here. It'll just go through the resistor. And because it's constantly sending current through that resistor, it's called a monitored system. And if the panel does decide to go into alarm, it's going to use maybe lights, maybe sirens, stuff like that to set off the alarm to say, ah, you know, someone's here, go into alarm, whatever, whatever these things do. Now, a keypad is going to have inputs, so it's going to tell the panel to do stuff or it's going to send information to it. So if we're sending information from something to the other, we would call that the input. And the alarm panel might also send an output to the keypad to have a display of information, for example. Now, all of our detecting devices, you know, if someone's going to break the window, you know, pressure contact, what have you, all of these are inputs to our alarm panel. So all of these just send information to the alarm panel. If there's nothing wrong, no one's trying to break in, all of these devices would say, yeah, we're good. They would just say that constantly, yeah, we're good, yeah, we're good, yeah, we're good, to the alarm panel. The alarm panel, when it wants to, when it goes into an alarm, is going to send an output to our signaling devices. Now, the codebook talks about, or sorry, I should say, the module talks about code rules that allow you to put uh, basically extra low voltage conductors and devices in cold air returns. So basically, since the cold air return goes throughout your house, the return duct that is, if the siren starts going off, it's going to send that noise echoing throughout that ductwork through the whole house. Now, obviously, you don't put a strobe light in the in the ductwork. That's not going to function very well. You're going to put that in very visible areas, maybe on each floor. But the siren and the strobe light, they don't say anything back to the alarm panel. They're just waiting to make noise or flash a light when they're told to. Now, this is kind of what I was talking about. Your module breaks down some necessary rules really well. Strongly advise you to go into your own code books and look at these. Maybe highlight them for tests or exams. Um, there's, there's a chance that they're going to come up. But this 22 gauge, so normally a general rule is we can't have conductors smaller than number 14 gauge. But we're in a specific section of the code book. So remember the general sections are 2, 2, 14, and 26. I might, be, uh, I might be forgetting about one of the sections. But this is section 16. I know that because it says 16-220, 212, 210, 210. So this is section 16. So these would be rules from a boss section or a supplemental section that would overrule the general section of the code book. So we can have, since it says in this supplemental section, since it says we can have conductors as small as 22 gauge or not smaller than 22 gauge, then we can go ahead and use, you know, maybe a 22 gauge four conductor cable going to glass break detectors. We have a rule for we have to use copper. Okay, cool. That's already our copper wires already our default. So, you know, the it's just kind of reinforcing the kind of conductor it wants. Now, it may seem redundant to say use copper since copper is our default, but if we were to use all aluminum wires in our alarm system, aluminum wires will slowly work their way out from under a terminal or under a splice when they're not done properly. Now, 
If a receptacle stops working, maybe your lamp doesn't turn on, TV doesn't turn on, you know, because you used aluminum wires for the receptacle, maybe that happens. But if your alarm system devices just stop working, that's a much bigger problem. We don't want them to stop working because a wire just, you know, sort of fell out from the terminal. So to avoid that problem that we come across when using aluminum conductors, copper has to be used for alarm systems. And then if you remember from uh, magnetism, if you've seen that video, if not, this will make more sense as you do that module and watch that lecture. When we put current on a conductor, it creates a magnetic field relative to where the current's going. So the current's coming out of the page, the magnetic field's going around like that. Now, the more current we put on that conductor, the larger the magnetic field. Our alarm systems are not gonna have a lot of current on their conductors, but if they're close to conductors that do have a lot of current on them, or more current than an alarm system wire, that magnetic field is gonna mess with the alarm wires. So we have to keep them away from each other, at least 50 millimeters. And then it gives you these rules as well. Go check these out. These just allow you to put um, class two circuits in boxed in cold air return plenums. So we talked about that a bit in a previous code module. Now let's talk about smoke alarms. So there's two types of smoke detectors or two forms of how we detect smoke. One is this radioactive type. So there's a source of very little radiation. Don't be worried about if you stand under your smoke detectors for too long, you'll, you know, lose brain cells or gain superpowers. That's not going to happen, fortunately or unfortunately. But how these work is there's a radioactive source, which is going to give a charge to these uh, particles. And those particles are going to constantly exchange, you know, the negative electrons, these negative particles are going to want to go to the positively charged plate. And the opposite is true for the positively charged particles. But when smoke gets in the way, when smoke fills the smoke alarm, or the smoke detector, the particles can't move as much, and the detector starts to go off. Similar function with um, the photoelectric smoke alarm, I believe I'm using the right term but it's going to use a light source that's going to go to a receiver. So it keeps sending this light to the receiver. And as long as the light is hitting the receiver, it's all good. But when there's a fire or if I burn my fajita fixings and I create a bunch of smoke from just cooking the crap out of some peppers, the smoke gets in the way of the light source and then the smoke alarm says, oh no, I'm not getting enough light to my receiver. There's going to be a smoke here. Start a chirping, make some noise, let people know that there's smoke. And where do we put these smoke alarms? Well, on every floor, for starters, because there's a chance for a fire on every single floor of a house. And we're also going to put them in every bedroom and outside of the bedrooms in the hallway because when people are sleeping, they're far more vulnerable to not know that there's a fire. And if there was a fire in the hallway, or let's say it's downstairs, and this whole hallway started to fill with smoke, and it was waiting in the doorways, then by the time any of the people sleeping in the bedrooms woke up and realized there was a fire, and they tried to get out through the door, well, they might pass out or possibly even die from smoke inhalation. And if they open the door, the smoke would fill the rooms. So then they might have to jump out through the window and before they get to the window or, you know, maybe, maybe they do get to the window and they hurt themselves by jumping out of the second, the second floor. If your bedroom was upstairs or maybe the window doesn't open in time, maybe it's a window you can't really get through easily all sorts of problems 
even though in a bedroom you should be able to, uh, you know, your, your window is one form of exit in case of this situation. But that's why we have this guy in the hallway. And then if these are all interlocked, these should wake up everyone that's sleeping. So if you've ever found that smoke alarms are kind of loud and annoying, they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be much more loud and annoying than an alarm clock. So how do we feed and power our smoke alarms? Well, we already talked about that a bit in the lab class, the, the, uh, the, the schematic diagram, that's the word I'm looking for, the schematic diagram for smoke alarms in three ways. The reason we drew it like that, well, logically speaking, we don't want to switch power to the smoke alarm. But the reason we had those smoke alarms on the same circuit as that three-way switching to a light, to that lighting circuit, is because 32200, installation of smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms in dwelling units, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms shall be supplied from a lighting circuit or from a circuit that supplies a mix of lighting and receptacles. Now, if your lighting circuit loses power and you go to turn the lights on, you're going to notice that. So that is why we put smoke alarms and that is why the code book states that you shall put smoke alarms and carbon monoxides, carbon monoxide alarms, excuse me, on a lighting circuit. And the reason we didn't put it aside from just logical, the reason we didn't put our smoke alarms, even though they were on the lighting circuit, we didn't put them you know, between the three ways or after the three ways is because there shall be no disconnecting means between the smoke alarm or the carbon monoxide alarm and the overcurrent device for the branch circuit. So just from breaker to smoke alarms. Down here, it's saying that the wiring method, including any interconnection of units and their associated equipment shall be in accordance with section 12. So that's just wiring methods. And B, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, or a device that is a combination of a smoke alarm and a carbon monoxide alarm, which is pretty common these days, shall not be installed with a circuit is protected by a ground fault circuit interrupter or an arc, arc fault circuit interrupter. So you can't put smoke alarms on GFCI or AFCI circuits or circuits that are protected by those kind of interrupters because those circuits are more likely to trip and lose power, which is what they're designed to do. But for our smoke alarms, that's not exactly safe for them just to lose power because of a AFCI breaker or circuit tripping. Now, if you have integral battery as a secondary supply source for your smoke alarm, well, you know, if the GFCI trips, that battery will take over. And usually, you know, depending on the smoke alarm or carbon monoxide alarm, it'll actually start chirping at you to say, hey, lost my power, want my power back. So that's 32200. That's sort of the, the things that are specific to smoke alarms. Now, just to reinforce that, we have a 14-2 that feeds the first smoke alarm. And then, so we have our, right, that's our line one and our identified. Perfect. Yeah, we gotta power those bad boys up. And then between them, between each smoke alarm, we have line one, we have our identified, and we have our traveler. So that's what that third wire is. So that if this is in the basement or this is upstairs, wherever one of the smoke alarms is, wherever they are, if one goes into alarm, they all go into alarm. And that's what that traveler does. If this guy says, oh, I got smoke, I'm an alarm. He goes, me too now, me too now. So that's why there's a 14-3 between each smoke alarm. And if each one has a battery backup, which they should, that's a good idea. Then even if the power's cut, if there's a fire in the house, 
all three of them should go into alarm. So now let's look at a fire alarm system. Now fire alarm systems probably use smoke detectors. It's a pretty handy device for a fire alarm system. They have this brain, you know, this main control panel. So that's sort of similar to what we've been talking about. It's as if you put a smoke detector on an alarm system or a security system. The one major difference for fire alarms is they have manual pull stations. So there's a place where if a human sees a fire and the fire alarm or the devices that are controlled or talk to the fire alarm, if those devices don't see the fire yet, someone can pull a manual pull station, which sends a signal back to this fire alarm control panel. So it's receiving a signal saying, hey, someone just told me there's a fire. Now, there's four sort of states for a fire alarm system to be in. Normal, well, that's kind of kind of kind of a straightforward indicator. Normal just means everything's fine. There's no problem with the system. All the devices work. There's no fire. I got no issues. Alarm, also maybe a bit of a straightforward one. Alarm says, there is a fire, make noise, flash the lights, everyone get the hell out of the building, there is a fire, I'm in alarm. So those are kind of, you know, when nothing's happening and then when everything is happening. But supervisory and trouble are sort of the two that are the easiest to be confused by. So trouble, the trouble indicator, when there's a trouble, it is the the fire alarm panel is telling usually the electrician that something is not working it's saying hey i have a you know a smoke detector that's not giving me the right feedback i have a fire detector that's not giving me the right feedback something is not working so there's a trouble in the system. There's a big trouble. You know, there's things could go very wrong if there's a fire. So that's a problem. You need to look into that. Supervisory is the alarm panel saying that something may not, oops, let's see if I can spell words may not work. So trouble is saying, nope, something don't work. You need to go look at everything basically to make sure you and find out what's not working. Supervisory is saying, well, something got changed and I'm not sure if it is or is not working. So you need to go check on the things that I am a supervisor of. So those are the four states that your fire alarm panel can be in. Um, usually the panel itself will beep and make noise and let people know and, you know, obviously turn these lights on when there's a trouble or a supervisory. When it's normal, you know, if everything is hooked up, right? When it's no under normal condition, um, nothing should be happening. It should just say, I'm all good. And of course, alarm would be make all the noises. Now, fire alarm systems are supervised circuits, not to be confused with their supervisory indicator, but fire alarms are supervised circuits. Now, what fire alarms watch for and what they need to sing signal us about is a life and death situation. So if anyone messes with anything in a fire alarm system it ha the the whole system has to know immediately it has to go into trouble maybe it goes into alarm it has to know what's going on at all times it's a life and death situation so to prevent people from messing with devices in a fire alarm system we never splice the wires 
under a terminal screw like this because then you can loosen the screw, take these wires out, and no, none's the wiser, right? Because if, if we think about our supervised circuit, if current it can come in and go back on this wire and keep going, that'd be like if we took this wire and spliced it to this wire, and then we took this device off of these two wires, well, the fire alarm system doesn't know any better. So we always go in and then out, in and then out. We can splice like this, one wire to one wire, but at the termination point of the device, we never do this. One in, one out. So let's look at this class B circuit. This is the last thing in the module. Now I should say, if you've made it to the end, um, this module is a is a doozy. It's a big one. Um, the fact it has fire alarm in it is a little bit ridiculous for first years, but if it's in the modules, that means it's fair game on the TQ. So that's just kind of the reality um, you as first year students find yourselves in. So all the same, um, shouldn't gripe about it. Let's just learn what we can. This is a class B circuit. Now you learn about fire alarm, you know, in its entirety in fourth year, and you talk about class A and class B circuits. Um, first year is just talking about class B for the most part. And a class B circuit is non addressable. which means this fire alarm control panel does not know what's what. It's just sending this current out, it gets it back, it's happy at this, you know, expected current rating. So just like our smoke alarms, you know, there's a smoke detector, a smoke alarm obviously has the, well, not obvious, but a smoke alarm has an audio or an audible device built in. So it's kind of a, a one-stop shop for sensing and alarming. A fire alarm control panel has these smoke detectors and then it has the alarms. So it has our initiating devices. So these get the party started and these are the party if you, if you want to think of it that way. So the initiating devices let us know if there's any problem if there's any smoke, if you're a smoke detector, and then our signaling devices, you know, maybe it's one of those little red bells that has a little arm in there. And if the alarm goes off, it just starts ringing like crazy to say, Hey, there's a fire, get the heck out of here. So it's a class B circuit. It's non addressable, which means if this wire is cut right here, it doesn't know which devices it can't see. It just says trouble. And you got to go check every single smoke detector and check every single pull station and everything connected, usually on the initiating side, to see what's not working properly, to see where you lost a wire. So that's it for that module. Um, as always, send me your questions if you have them.